by some eyewitness accounts, these were the words the 19-year-old Louis Auguste uttered to himself upon receiving word that the former king was dead, and that the crown was now his. Outwardly, he bore this charge with apparent stoicism. Of the dark day of May 7th, Louis' journal merely remarks that the king is dead, nothing more. This single entry marks the founding of Louis' regal facade, an impenetrable countenance which revealed nothing about his true, honest feelings. It is impossible to know what Louis felt at this time. He left no entries, nor did he later share his experience with family or confidant. But I think we can guess what he was feeling. The foreboding contemplations that would have marred his every waking moment. What God would conspire to plant a scepter in the hand of one so young, so ill-prepared? What terrible misfortune had befallen him to be the great man of his house at barely 19? What woes would he face as a political neophyte, pushed and prodded by the innumerable factions in that nest of vipers that was the royal court? What perils would prove his downfall? What friends would turn traitor? But worst of all, there was the ever-present spectre of financial disaster. All too well did Louis know of the failings of his late grandfather, and that he had inherited those woes. And awareness of looming catastrophe was compounded by young Louis's shortcomings as a man, and now too, as a monarch. Whatever solutions there might be, were beyond his capacity to discern, much less his ability to attain. In specific terms, Louis was all too prescient of the financial woes that had befallen his kingdom. Exacerbated by socio-political factors, France was in the midst of a severe financial crisis in 1774, the result of war debts, diminishing revenue, and financial mismanagement. Those attempts made by Louis XV and his ministers at thwarting disaster had run aground against the intransigence of the nobility. Parlement, the guys who could ratify the legislation to fix all of this, had stopped dead, desperately needed financial reform. Under the pump, the former king sought answers in absolutism, thus turning to tyranny to register his reforms. Suppression or exile of the Parlement had made space for reform, but left Louis XVI one hell of a conundrum. The first great question of his reign, should Parlement remain disempowered? Or should they be courted, brought back into the fold, restored so that they might be essential actors in the reform process? Certainly, recalling Parlement would be a popular move. As it was, the time-rich parlementaires had spent their exile professing their devotion to liberty and opposition to royal tyranny to ready listeners among the Third Estate. The people clamoured for their restoration. Then again, any self-respecting absolutist would not suffer the Parlement's insolence. Had they not, when given the privilege of participation, blocked and obfuscated at every turn? Louis had more than merely reform to consider. He now had an absolutist flame to keep kindled. So, parlez with the Parlement, or forge on without them. Louis didn't have the answers to these questions. He was young and inexperienced, and of all people, Louis knew this best. At the onset of his reign, there was only one minister who tried to help him navigate these pitfalls. The slippery statesman Louis Pelipeau, Marquis Lavrillier, Minister of the Interior. Even with his grandfather's body still warm, Louis sought to add another trustworthy figure to his tiny inner circle. He pretty emphatically didn't want a prime minister. As an absolutist, Louis wanted to be at the centre of all decision-making, so what he was really looking for was a senior advisor. Thus he penned a secret letter to exiled former statesman Jean-Frédéric Pelipeau, Comte de Maribas, and Lavrillier's cousin. 
When the letter reached the Comte at his estate in Pontchartrain, he was old. In his seventies, no less. Born in 1701 in the Noblesse de Brobe, he had spent his decades-long career in government service, managing the navy and advising the Council de Roy. Moreover, he had been acting mayor of Paris and had cordial relations with the Parlement there. An excellent negotiator, possessed of an analytical mind like Louis, he was a natural pick. And the choice was rendered even more obvious for the simple reason that Louis could trust de Maurepas, who had been, at one time, Louis's childhood tutor. In addition to his chosen men, Louis inherited his grandfather's council, purpose-built to weaken the Parlement. There was the Comte René Nicolas Charles Augustine de Maupeu, Chancellor, senior advisor and personal friend of the late king. As cunning as he was ugly, Maupeu was the dominant figure in royal politics, a force to be reckoned with. Across the table was soldier statesman Emmanuel Armand de Richelieu, Duc de Augilion. The Duke was in charge at one of those times where both the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the army was the same person. And in both posts, he conducted himself with considerable tact. The Abbe Joseph Marie Terre, as we know, held the post of Controller General of Finance. Levying extra taxes, rationalizing state expenses, and forcing foreign loans made the industrious Terre a deeply unpopular figure. Minister of the Marine was minor lordling Pierre Etienne de Boyne. And then, of course, was La Vrillière as Minister of the Interior. Every one of these ministers were to varying degrees political rivals. All encroached on the purviews of the others, leading to jurisdictional competition. Add in a smattering of graft, and that pretty well sums these guys up. For his part, Louis did not like the ministers. He found the men of money distasteful, and the men of experience impersonable. Nonetheless, Louis mostly agreed with them on policy, intimidated by their years of experience. The Consul de Roy first met in May, and for a few weeks, Maupu held the line, making sure that it was continuation, not course correction, that occupied official business. But behind the scenes, plots were afoot, set in motion by Maurepas. Pressure had to be placed on Maupu and the other ministers to go, so that Morepa could come out on top as the dominant figure in the council, able to enact the king's agenda, whatever that might be. By serving the king's interest, Morepa could reassert his own material and political status. To that end, Morepa began to orchestrate a purge. The first minister to fall was the Duc de Orgillon, who, sensing his influence slipping, preemptively resigned. Perhaps he expected that his allies would intercede on his behalf, and indeed the king's brother had urged Louis to keep the duke on. Yet Augereau was quietly let go, replaced by the brilliant diplomat Charles Gravier de Vergen. A popular pick, he was especially liked by Maupeu, who found that Vergen was inclined to support him on the council, quite unlike the departed duke. So a false start for Maurepas. To make matters worse, Louis appointed a confidant from his youth, soldier statesman the Comte de Moy, as Secretary of War, yet another of Maupu's mates. Attacked for his lack of an official appointment, Morapa feared for his position, and so redoubled his efforts. Whispering in Louis's ear, he played to the king's distaste for the imperious, austere style of Maupu, and pointed out that during 15's reign, it was Maupu's decision to not financially compensate the parlementaires after their exile. Such spite was intended only to ruin some of his old enemies in the Parlement. The collateral damage was many other parlementaires who had business or financial interests in the capital. Offered a chance to explain, Maupu refused to comment. This only confirmed the king's already low opinion of the man. By August, Maurepas had successfully enforced some structural changes on the Council de Roy. Firstly, he had managed to devolve some of its powers to committees that had specific purview, giving him greater influence over his rivals' jurisdictions. And secondly, he had managed to rewrite the royal itinerary, which meant he could keep Louis out of Versailles most of the year. This was significant, 
because all other ministers resided in Versailles or Paris, and therefore had to make arrangements to talk with Louis through official channels when he was away. Maurepas, on the other hand, as an advisor, had his own informal channels through which to access the king. So I think you can see who's starting to disproportionately influence the young king's decision-making. When in July a minor scandal cropped up regarding some corruption in the grain trade, ostensibly the purview of Therese's Ministry of Finance, Louis eschewed Therese entirely and had Maurepas handle the matter. After months of frenzied preparation, Maurepas finally believed he had enough clout to convince Louis to purge the council. Mid-morning, August 23rd, after having spent the morning reviewing judicial appointments, Maurepas attended Louis in private. He broached the idea of a purge, and found that Louis had, more or less, come to the same conclusion, but just couldn't bring himself to go through with it. In breach of protocol, Maurepas ditched the niceties, and beseeched Louis to strike while the iron was hot. Before the day was through, Maupu and There were both gone. There dipped out with apparent grace, but Maupu refused to give up the seals. Fortunately for all, a deal was struck, and so he remained Chancellor of France in name, but relinquished claims to be Keeper of the Seals. His purge complete, Maurepa was ascendant. Therefore he picked the replacements. To be the new Keeper of the Seals, he appointed his friend, Armand Thomas U. de Méromancille, former president to the Parlement de Normandie at Rouen. Functionally, he was an ambassador to the Parlement on behalf of the Crown. A friendly face to bear royal decree. But most critical to the story of the pre-revolution, I think, was Maurepas' replacement for Controller General of Finance. Financial reform supreme on Louis' agenda, Maurepas appointed the financial reformer. Homegrown wonder, Anne-Robert Turgot. Unlike previous controllers general, Turgot was a product of the Enlightenment, positively predisposed towards free trade and market competition. This was because he was a physiocrat. Physiocracy was a newish economic concept holding that wealth was derived mostly from the land, and thus the health of state finances were dependent on the health of the agricultural sector. For this reason, Turgot spurned outmoded mercantilism and sought to address the issue of regressive taxation. But here's the kicker. Turgot's financial regimen was more than mere theory. He'd put it into practice. As intendant of Dirt Pour Le Monde, Turgot had worked miracles by lowering regressive taxes on rural peasants, increasing agricultural output, and reducing regulations on the grain trade to promote competition. Taking office, he wanted to apply these same basic solutions to the national economy. Well known and widely popular, Turgot's appointment was met with great optimism. The Parlement saw him as one of their own, and so too did the nobility, from whose ranks Turgot was plucked. The royal ministry had vetted him, and the king personally liked Turgot. All in all, he must have felt pretty bloody good about entering office. The floor fell out from Turgot, however, when he called up the ledgers, and crunched the numbers. The situation was abysmal. War debts from decades of expensive conflict had forced the kingdom to take massive loans upon which they were servicing immense interest. Now, Therese had managed to rectify the situation somewhat, bringing the deficit down to a massive, but at least somewhat manageable, 25 million livres. The problem was that this debt would only mount as state expenses continued to soar and state revenue precipitously declined. What really compounded this revenue problem was the tax system. Just all of it. It had two major flaws. Firstly, it was regressive, like the Lemonia tax system before Togo had stepped in. That meant that those least able to pay taxes were, proportionately, more adversely affected by them than the better off classes. 5% yearly income for a rural peasant is a lot more to them than 5% is for a well to do merchant. So the system made the poor poorer and each year demanded more from them. Corruption was the other great problem. There existed more mechanisms for middle or upper class families to avoid paying tax than mechanisms for enforcing tax collection upon them. 
The nobility possessed their much-coveted privileges, which meant that they were only subjected to select taxes. And even then, often they bribed their way into exemptions from taxes like the Vatiem, or bought off tax collectors to undervalue their estates. Middle-income groups, likewise, perfected the art of corruption. But at least they had decent reasons. Most were not rich. That is to say, with a lot of cash on hand. Their wealth was tied up in investments or assets. And with some sectors of the French economy in recession, many of these investments were no longer paying dividends. Moreover, these people, artisans, merchants, guildsmen, lawyers, scholars, paid exorbitant tariffs or feudal dues, which cut into meagre funds even further. For them, tax fraud was a survival tactic. Thore predicted some 80 million livres for 1774. Togo knew that was optimistic, to say the least. Tax revenue was way down. Mercantilist policy stifled domestic trade with excessive tariffs, and empowered guilds blocked out competition by refusing to sell equipment and denying loans to prospective startups, leading to monopolies in every industry. Defeat and the loss of colonial North America and French Canada locked the kingdom out of the extremely lucrative fur trade. And much to Turgot's dismay, the French agricultural sector was suffering from poor harvests due to outdated techniques and a lack of industrialization. Inflation was on the rise, and wages, if you even made a wage, were slipping. And to top it all off, the crown was running a spending spree, rearmament and pensioning mostly, as though nothing were the matter. The deeper Turgot got, the worse it looked. As Turgot got stuck in, reproachment with the Parlement seemed on the horizon. Each of the ministers over several council sessions exerted their influence over Louis to convince him to recall the Parlement from exile. Now this went against every fibre of Louis's upbringing, and he ummed and ahed. But eventually, Maurepas managed to reconcile absolutism with clemency. Restoring the Parlement, he claimed, would demonstrate that Louis's reign would be different. Peaceful and just, the road paved for cooperation. Besides which, most parliamentaires were milling about, promoting anti-government sentiment and turning public opinion against the king, with newspapers, pamphlets and salon rhetoric. At the very least, restoring them meant that these activities would cease. But if there was to be a lasting peace, there had to be a treaty. The conditions of the reproachment of 1774 were many, but the main one was that the Grand Chamber, stuffed with the king's chosen men, would be empowered. Moreover, if in the event of a parliamentary strike, say in protest to a new tax, then Parliament's powers would be divested to a so-called Grand Council, controlled by the Conseil de Roy. So theoretically at least, there was a way to pass laws without Parliament's approval. Therefore, if Parliament wanted to pull a political stunt, they would be risking their position at the negotiating table. Recalling the Parliament was going to be a broadly popular move. That being said, any recall was going to piss off the Grand Chamber. Back when, the Grand Chambers had submitted, and aided Louis XV by voting in favour of the exile of their own Parliament. In the case of the Paris Parliament, when its members were exiled, the Grand Chamber's loyalty had been rewarded, its members permitted to remain active in the judiciary. It was a pretty sweet deal. They basically got to run the French judicial system after 1771. Louis XVI's callous disregard for past loyalty swiftly turned these men from humble servants to stalwart foes. Louis met in Paris at the Palais de Justice with representatives of the 13 Parlement on November 12th. Here, the King delivered a lit de justice enforcing the restoration of the Parlement. Delivering his speech from memory to a packed hall, Louis impressed the representatives with his calm and eloquence. They swore an oath of fealty to the new king, disabused of the notion that he would be anything like his grandfather. Leaving the palace, Louis was met with jubilant celebration. The legacy of Louis XVI, it was now said, would be like that of the beloved Henry IV, peacemaker, just and benevolent, all across the kingdom, he received praise. Louis had won the hearts of the people and was very pleased with himself. <laughs>
Philosopher and mathematician Jean d'Alembert remarked of the whole affair, A better day dawns upon us. While the king was having a good year, Togo was not. He had begun his tenure by enforcing expenditure oversight on all government departments, aimed at rooting out corruption and curbing rampant spending. He also made successful overtures to the king for support in limiting the provision of state pensions, which were draining the treasury. Indeed, when naval minister de Boyne retired and was pensioned, he received only a paltry 20,000 livres per year. The basis covered to go set his sights a bit higher. He proposed some minor reforms for the farmers general, but finding little enthusiasm for this endeavour made only slight modifications. Togo had more success when he began free trade reforms that limited tariffs on domestically traded goods, like wine, corn and grain. This free trade reform was pretty uncompromising. Every time a new mercantilist policy was recommended, Togo shut it down. The problem of the taiyi, the tax that gouged the poor masses of the third estate, weighed heavy in the priorities of the socially minded controller general, and so the tax was eased. So far so good. But Togo overstepped in mid-September 1774, with an edict intended to bring competition to the grain market. For noblemen and merchants who speculated in the grain trade, and already pissed at Togo's campaign against corruption, the move was both insult and injury. Unfortunately for Togo, the exact predicament his changes were meant to prevent, inflating bread prices in times of famine, happened, just before they could be enacted. Up north, Normandy's failed harvest had resulted in a minor famine. Coming into a town or city, emaciated bodies, piled by the road, were an all too common sight. Starving, the peasants looked for cheap bread, and found none. For their troubles, they pinned the blame on Togo. Violence erupted, and quickly ballooned into a series of revolts that racked the kingdom throughout the summer of 74 to 75. To prevent such a disaster from occurring again, Togo wanted to go further than his initial regulations, and fix the prices of bread full stop. But the king wasn't so convinced. It's funny, because Louis and Togo otherwise had a pretty great relationship. They were quite alike, both over-analytical and terribly awkward. They read the same books, had compatible beliefs, and believed deeply in the case for reform. Actually, despite his initial hesitancy to place an avowed physiocrat on the Council de Roy, Louis had come to appreciate Togo's effectiveness and his candour. Problem was that his reforms ran afoul of the nobility. Louis faced mounting pressure to rein him in. On the 2nd of May, however, they stood firm in the face of mobs descending on Paris and Versailles. Both agreed that such a crisis could only be dealt with by decisive action from on high. And to set the trend for things to come, the Paris Parlement disagreed. In the first confrontation between Louis and the Paris Parlement since their restoration, they submitted to the king a demand that he lower the price of bread to appease the rioters. Insulted and not a little hurt, Louis summoned them to the palace on May 5th, and informed them that they had no place dictating terms. That was an end of it. Instead, he and Togo ordered regional commanders to use whatever means necessary to crush the revolts. 25,000 troops brutally quashed the riots in the capital. Garrisons were installed in the markets, and the Hall à Bleu, Paris's main grain reserve, was closely guarded. In the aftermath, several hundred agitators were arrested and held at the Bastille. Two were eventually executed. The so-called Flower Wars petered out after a few more weeks, during which time Louis was officially coronated. Here the relationship between Togo and the king came under strain, over the seemingly inconsequential issue of where the coronation ceremony was to be held and what vows would be taken. Louis wanted to be crowned at Rams for religious reasons. Togo wanted him to be crowned in Paris, because the merchants and tax collectors had promised a whopping three million livres to the treasury in expectation of the business the coronation would bring. The flower wall had been an expensive and prolonged misfortune. The crown needed the money. And as for what to say? Well, Togo wanted a part about crushing heresy in France omitted much to Louis' dismay. Maurepas, feeling that his influence on Louis was waning, played to the king's religious fears and drove a wedge between him and Togo over this issue. 
In the end, Louis was coronated at the cathedral in Reims, but gave only a neutered promise to remove heretics. Another flashpoint between king and minister emerged in March of 1775 over the issue of war. For several months now, envoys and diplomats from the fledgling United States of America, embroiled in its war for independence, had entreated Louis to intervene. And if not intervene, at least send us some guns, ammunition, cannons, whatever you've got. Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson were esteemed guests in the homes of Paris's upper crust, until we felt their pressure to grant the American request. Turgot, however, would have none of it. The money to pay for more arms, more ammunition, or, God forbid, a full-scale war, simply didn't exist. Colossal loans would have to be taken, and was the state not already in enough debt? The issue of war put to bed, for now, 1775 saw Togo continue his sterling work. He began negotiations to take loans from the Dutch at a very reasonable 4% interest. Money for the next few years sorted, he then organised a land survey to assess the feasibility of his financial reforms. And when the results came in, he began to draft his reform package. What emerged by January 1776 was Turgot's magnum opus, his six edicts. To introduce the reforms, Turgot requested and received a séance royale from Louis. In attendance at the Palais de la Cité was the Paris Parlement and the Conseil de Roy, with the king popping in and out. When Turgot entered the Palais, he was already spurned by his peers and the nobility, and despised by the people. None of that deterred him, however. Point by point, he plodded along nervously, halting awkwardly every once in a while. The first point concerned measures to break monopolies in the grain trade. The second point took that theme and ran with it, calling for the systematic reduction of the privileges and exemptions afforded to the guilds, in order to break the monopolies that were so harmful to French trade. Though some industries were exempted from the change, most were targeted. Immediately, the proposal was decried as radical. Still, Turgo pressed on to his third point, the abolition of the corvée. For centuries, the corvée had been the bane of the rural peasantry. Upon the order of a nobleman, peasants at their own expense were required to work unpaid on the construction and upkeep of roads and other rural infrastructure. The alternative was to provide resources for the work, or face arrest. The corvée kept the peasants from productive work on the farms, but conveniently exempted the clergy and those living in towns and cities. As incensed as the Palimor were that Togo wanted to take away the corvée, they became positively livid when he proposed replacing it with a flat money tax. The tax would take no account of privilege, and be fully applicable to both the clergy and the nobility. Not only would it hurt their wallets, but a money tax pained the egos of the noble parlementaires, who were insulted to be in the same tax bracket as peasants. This third point was the most incendiary. Togo delivered his last three points concerning anti-corruption measures and the abolition of taxes on cattle and other animal products. Nothing really too crazy. Once finished, the seance exploded into fevered debate. Denunciations of Togo came thick and fast. Explanations he offered to justify his points failed to deter the Parlement. They would not hear of Togo's taxes, much less his edicts. The man's manner couldn't have helped here. He was often condescending and patronising, just completely tactless and prone to interjections. For several days, things continued like this. Soon, Parlement delivered an official remonstrance against the money tax, officially condemning the inclusion of the clergy. Maurepas was alarmed and intervened, aiming at compromise. Hoping that it might garner some goodwill, Togo gave ground and omitted the clergy from the money tax. Louis, meanwhile, found himself defending the controller general more than he might have liked. While he promised to uphold the sacred noble and clerical privileges of the Ancien Regime, Louis also attempted to convince the Palima of the need for reform. He tried to frame the money tax as a point of pride for those who would pay it, noblemen and peasant alike. But he found the Palima unreceptive. If the going was tough for Louis, well it was hell for Togo. Throughout January, 
no matter what he did, the Parlement would not entertain the six edicts, even when modified. As the debate grew more and more divisive, and to go became a pariah, Louis was finding it harder and harder to defend his chosen minister. Despite his personal reservations, Miram Mansil worked to placate the Parlement, but to no avail. And it was probably Miram Mansil's failure that convinced Maura Parr to recommend to Louis on February 4th that he issue a lit de justice and force the edicts to be registered. It was not only necessary, he argued, to force the issue, but also to assert dominance over the Parlement. If they successfully resisted the edicts, it would be an immensely damaging public repudiation of Louis's absolutist authority. In official communiques, Togo prodded Louis in the same direction. Profoundly aware that this decision was existential, and pressured by his ministers, Louis took one final look at the edicts on the council meeting of March 4th. Doubly sure of their validity, the next day he took personal charge, having each parlementaire receive the edicts on paper, and letting them know that they would be made law by Lee de Justice on March 12th. They had one week's time to make their complaints official with remonstrances. The time passed, the Lee de Justice went ahead, and the edicts were registered. But in reaching this milestone, Turgot had expended all of his political capital, and soon found himself isolated. Even within the Conseil de Roy, he was no longer welcome. Menemensil made sure of that. To some extent, though how much we can't say, Minamen Seal had conspired with his old mates in the Parlement to undermine Togo's public image. Like the Parlement, he believed that Togo would jeopardise the nobility's entire way of life. As far as Morapa was concerned, Togo had served his purpose and borne the brunt of backlash against reform. He was now deadweight. So Morapa soon joined Minamen Seal in opposition to Togo and both circled like sharks, awaiting their chance to strike. That moment came after the president of the Corps de Aides, Guillaume Chrétien de Lamoignon de Malachab, elder statesman and famous juror, signalled his intention to resign. He had, for some time, been disconcerted by what appeared to him to be Louis's dismissiveness towards legal matters. We know that young Louis had a lot on his plate, and was just overwhelmed. But all Malachab saw was a king focused solely on reform. So in protest he wrote to Louis, reminding the king that he had only seen him once in several months. Their business impossible, Malachab wanted to resign. They parted on good terms. To replace Malachab, Morapa and Miramen Sil had a chosen candidate. A candidate utterly anathemic to Turgo. So the Controller General turned to the king to block the appointment. But Louis avoided Turgo like the plague. He was, after all, radioactive after the six edicts. Desperate, Turgo wrote letter after letter imploring Louis to choose someone else. Each letter went unheeded. In a final, truly desperate letter, Turgo stated that the people believed Louis was a weak king, and that for a time, he too had believed it. You need me, said Turgo. I who did such exemplary service during the Flower Wars, who drafted the six edicts, who pushed them through. But this letter was too much, even for meek, non-confrontational Louis. Cornered by Miramant Seal, outplayed by Morapa, spurned by the king. Turgot preferred to resign, his dignity intact. He issued his resignation letter on May 10th. It went ignored for two days until, on May 12th, Togo awoke to find that he had been issued a letter de cachet, removing him from his post. Togo was fired. His final instructions were to leave Versailles at once. Au revoir, Togo. <laughs>